I like to use the phrase, if I can't say no, my yes doesn't mean anything. And so I think a lot about giving people the opportunity to say no and then rewarding them for saying no by being really upbeat and happy about it. Because to me, when someone says no to me, that is a signal of trust. They trust that I am not going to violate their consent. They trust that I care about their no, that I'm not going to punish them for it. And that's that's really, really important. So by modeling that, I am then impacting the community. I'm creating a ripple effect where people see that working and are like, wow, this person seems really happy when they have those interactions. And Kitty doesn't seem devastated when she hears, no, I want that for myself. How do I do that? Maybe, maybe it's my anarchist roots, but that has been so much more effective for me as an educator than telling people what to do. Welcome to the Multi Amory Podcast. I'm Jace. I'm Emily. And I'm Dedeker. We believe in looking to the future of relationships, not maintaining the status quo of the past. Whether you're monogamous, polyamorous, swinging, casually dating, or if you just do relationships differently, we see you and we're here for you. On this episode of the Multi Amory Podcast, we're continuing our conversation with Kitty Stryker about consent questions from you, our audience. These were specifically questions that were asked by our supporters. If you have a question you would like to ask in the future, become one of our supporters. You can go to multiamory.com slash join and learn about how to do that there. Just to tell you again, in case you're just joining us for this second episode, Kitty Stryker, our fabulous guest, has been working on defining and creating a consent culture for over 13 years through her writing, workshops, and website, consentculture.com. She's the editor of Ask, Building Consent Culture, the author of Ask Yourself, the Consent Culture Workbook, and is especially interested in bringing conversations about consent out of the bedroom and into everyday life. If you would also like to learn more about our fundamental communication tools that get referenced in some of these question answers, you can check out our book, Multi Amory Essential Tools for Modern Relationships, which covers some of our most used communication tools for all types of relationships. You can find links to buy it at multiamory.com slash book or wherever fine books are sold. Also, check out the first nine episodes of our podcast where we go over some of our most widely used and shared communication tools. All righty, so let's continue on with the next question. First and foremost, Kitty, you're fabulous, and thank you so much for taking questions and also for pioneering the idea of consent culture. Oh, shucks. Amazing. Do you have any thoughts on how we as a culture and society help educate folks on the idea of coercive consent and unconscious power dynamics in life. I asked this question in relation to the surge of unicorn hunters and how that relates Mm -hmm. to couples' privileges in general. We often hear the sentiment, well, if everyone is on board with the structure, then it's fine and consensual. But what those folks seem to have a hard time grasping is the idea of coercive consent and unconscious power dynamics. How can we teach that How you relate to people affects their ability to consent in situations like unicorn hunting. I've tried examples like doctor slash patient and professor slash student, but it doesn't resonate with the crowd. What other ways can we explain this nuance outside of the fries model to foster consent culture in non-monogamy? Sincerely, how you relate to people affects their ability to consent. (laughs) That's such a big question. Well, first of all, you should make them all buy my workbook. <laughs> first I, first I things have, first. I have several questions specifically about um, power dynamics in society and like how that can impact our understanding of consent and how comfortable someone else feels they can say no to us or vice versa, how comfortable we feel saying no to somebody else. First of all, I think that not everybody wants to understand this. Mm -hmm. Um, For sure. (laughs) And I think Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. that is its own problem and a little bit harder to address. In order to really 
understand this to be true, we have to then take some sort of responsibility about it. And it's much easier to not do that. <laughs> um, it is not as ethical, certainly, but it is easier. So I think that that is sort of a big unfortunate aspect to this is that, you know, I mean, same with conversations about privilege and about, you know, passing and all of these things that it's it's easier for a lot of people who have the power to just not choose not to understand. And I would even say it's 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 hard when you are the marginalized person or the person with less power, in those situations when you start to realize that your consent has been made more difficult by your marginalization in society, and that's something you don't always have control over, I think that is extremely upsetting and um, destabilizing in a lot of ways. So I think that a lot of people choose to sort of push that away because it's, it can be kind of hard to navigate in the world when you're aware of all of these things. It's very much that sort of um, the actual definition of a red pill, not what they've made it into. But like mm. there is that sense of like, I can't go back now. I know this and I can't not know this eating of the tree of knowledge, et cetera, et cetera. So I guess one of the things that's been important for me is to recognize that it is hard for people to sit with this stuff. And I try not to resent them for that, even though this stuff haunts my dreams, because I do understand, like, I, I have to acknowledge it's really rocked my shit. And I'm more stable around this stuff than a lot of folks. And it's still totally rocked my shit. So like, I think that's important to recognize and to be gentle with yourself and to be gentle with those around you to a point. However, like with any kind of privilege, just because you don't want to learn about it doesn't mean it doesn't still exist. It doesn't mean it doesn't still influence people and doesn't mean that ignoring it doesn't hurt people directly. So what to do with that? I mean, I would I would say my first advice is get new friends. Um, <laughs> like, <laughs> It's really, it's really hard to get people to engage with this when they're not ready to. It's, it's almost like trying to explain to an addict that their addiction is harming them. Like, if they're not ready, they're not ready. And you're just going to drive yourself crazy trying to get them to be ready. Um, now, that isn't always practical. You can't just go and make new friends necessarily. So I think figure out what your limits are and what your boundaries are and then stick to those. Like I said in the first half of this, it's really important, I think, to recognize what your consent is and that you have control over your decisions and your environment and you can decide that you do not wish to have that interaction like you get to have boundaries now and add, add a caveat to that that sometimes most of the time you get to do that sometimes you're in a family that you can't just opt out of or sometimes you're at a workplace that you can't ignore your boss or your coworker, or you are you're a student and you can't just disengage from your professor so like there, there's ways in which it becomes more complicated sometimes the better thing to do is to enlist help. Sometimes disengaging is best. Sometimes going to therapy so that you could just rant at somebody about how frustrated you are so that you get that validation and you get to express it while still biting your tongue when you have to. Sometimes that's the best thing. It's really hard to say. It's kind of up to you what works. So this question what we read was sort of a paraphrase of the actual question because it was very long. Uh, one thing I did want to clarify is that the question asker initially asked this as kind of thoughts on how we as a culture and society can help educate people here. But I do think that this question of educating a particular person, right, as if this were someone in your community or a friend or something, it also brings up a little bit the question for me of, as we've talked about, consent is tricky and depends a lot on the situation and who's in it. And when it comes to something like unicorn hunting, which 
is something that, you know, we've talked about since basically the beginning of this show as like, this is potentially problematic. However, over the years, lots of people who are unicorns have really spoken out in defense of that dynamic saying, yes, what you're saying is true, but it's not always that. And for you to then put that on all of us, that sucks too. And so I guess that's just a question that comes up for me is a little bit of this yeah, where's the difference between kind of like culturally acknowledging these things and educating our communities versus when is it I'm trying to put my values on someone else that isn't necessarily just a consent question? Yeah, I mean, I, I like to speak to what my experience is. And I think that by making it about making it about me, <laughs> I am then saying this is my bias. This is how I see the world. And you do not have to agree with me. I have been in unicorn hunting type relationships as the unicorn, and it's been a blast. A lot of the reason why it's been a blast is because I have felt like I could leave at any time. I had the ultimate, like, they knew they were lucky to have me. And so I had a lot of power there in those relationships. And that made it feel really comfortable for me. When I felt that power dynamic shift, I left. I was also younger and much more precocious in many ways. I think that now I'm just more tired. I have more of a tendency if I'm in a relationship, I'm just like, this is fine. It'll do whatever. Like, which is part of why I'm not dating right now is I need to like break myself of that habit. But like, yeah, I think we can only speak for ourselves. And I think that maybe the thing to do is to educate. Here are some ways that could be better. Like here are some more positive ways to give people an out. And so that, you know, they're opting in. I, I, I like to use the phrase, if I can't say no, my yes doesn't mean anything. And so I think a lot about giving people the opportunity to say no and then rewarding them for saying no by being really upbeat and happy about it. Because to me, when someone says no to me, that is a signal of trust. They trust that I am not going to violate their consent. They trust that I care about their no, that I'm not going to punish them for it. And that's that's really, really important. So by modeling that, I am then impacting the community. I'm creating a ripple effect where people see that working and are like, wow, this person seems really happy when they have those interactions. And Kitty doesn't seem devastated when she hears, no, I want that for myself. How do I do that? Maybe, maybe it's my anarchist roots, but that has been so much more effective for me as an educator than telling people what to do. <laughs> That's really I fucking just, profound. <laughs> That's good. I just, yeah. I just show, I just show people, and they, you know, if they want what I have, then they figure out how to mimic it. You know, I think that in general, I would like to see education of community in for all things be more that, be more of being the change you want to see in the world, because I think that that has more of a longstanding effect, and it does it does kind of self filter. You find that the people who are doing these things in a predatory way tend to drift away when you're super accountable because that's becomes really obvious. Like if everybody is being very vulnerable and having these conversations about consent and negotiation and no and yes and complicated feelings about coercion and self coercion and society pressures and all of these things, well, if you're the person who's like, nope, I don't feel any of those things, everyone's going to be really suspicious of you. <laughs> you mm -hmm. become so sus by doing that. So, I mean, I think it kind of sorts the wheat from the chaff by itself. <laughs> yeah, I feel like I know people recently who are sort of on two sides of this. I have a good friend who just got divorced and he's like, I really want to be the unicorn, the third in a situation with a couple that's established. I love that idea, especially like getting back out there after being in a really long term relationship with one person for a while. That sounds like a great thing. And then I have a coworker who is just entering sort of non monogamy for the first time through the lens of we're a couple that is looking for a third. And in that way, I'm like, some of the stuff that you're relaying to me sounds a little sus, like you just said. <laughs> And a little bit like this maybe is not going to be done in the most ethical manner. Now, 
I'm an educator too, but I don't want to just throw out unsolicited advice to this person, even though I do think these are the types of people, like the the kind of monogamous-centric people who are coming at it from that lens, that they're the ones that kind of need the most help in that way. Whereas my other friend, he really seems like he understands what he's getting himself into. Not to say that feelings won't happen and that people might get upset about certain things that occur. That's That all is a possibility. But yeah, this this idea that if somebody knows, okay, this is really what I want at this point in my life, I think that that's okay. And that we don't need to yeah. tell them that that's not what they're actually going to want. Yeah, I mean, and and I got to say, I feel like there is a gendered aspect to this. Like, I, I, And again, it's not just a gendered thing. There's also other marginalizations that can come into play. You know, if you're a person of color who's dating a white couple, that's going to come up, you know, <laughs> like that's absolutely going to come up. I think that there are situations where people will say that they want to have no hierarchy poly, but are enacting hierarchy poly because at the end of the day, there's only so many hours in the day. If you can only have a plus one to an event, you're probably going to go with the person that is your main couple person, or there's potentially going to be a big debate because you want to bring the new shiny, you know? It's like, <laughs> that's, I think you have to, like, as somebody who loved being a third for a while, I had to understand that there was a certain level of me being a really cared for pet, but also that I didn't weigh in on the mortgage, which was which was frustrating in, a, in some ways because it meant big decisions. I didn't really get as much of a say in our dynamic, but also it meant when there were big fights, I didn't have to show up. I could be like, peace. <laughs> that sounds hard. <laughs> Good luck with that. So, I mean, with great power comes great responsibility, I guess, is, <laughs> was something that I think helps people understand it a little bit more. I think encouraging communication helps a lot. I want to shout out uh, Lola Phoenix's Anxious Person's Guide to Non-Monogamy so as great. being amazing and i really love lola because lola kicks your ass it's not there's a lot of relationship advice books that are really like feelsy and like oh you're just really in your heart and lola's like look we're sorting this out you're gonna <laughs> figure it out you're gonna figure out what you need and i'm going to be compassionate but also i'm not going to coddle you <laughs> in a way that I found extremely refreshing. So yeah, I would definitely recommend that. I think that that helps a lot. I think that a lot of Lola's writing really made me understand where I had felt really frustrated about relationship dynamics where I felt like a partner was playing us against each other or, you know, felt like, oh, I I am the fat partner and I don't get to go out to things with you. And that is really upsetting, you know, because it makes me feel like I'm being hidden away. And now I understand more about those dynamics. Also, though, again, it comes back to you got to do this work on yourself. You got to know who you are, what you want, to what end. You want a third person in the relationship. You need to really be honest with yourself and say, to what end? Do I want a sex toy in the closet who's a person? Do I want somebody to provide unpaid childcare? Be honest with yourself. You might find that person who is super into that and that is the thing that they want. But if you're not being honest with yourself, you're not being honest with anybody else. And Oof, that's a problem. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. It, and it's so funny. I think that because I know a lot of polyamorous people who seem to take it on as their personal mission to have to eradicate all unicorn hunting in the world or, or to educate all the unicorn hunters about how they're doing it wrong. And while some of that has been good and has helped to move this conversation forward for many people, I have seen that backfire a little bit the same way that I've seen some of the non-hierarchy conversations backfire in the yeah. sense that people... Like, it's very important for us to talk about hierarchy versus non-hierarchy. Like, so important for us to be aware of those things. But what that's translated to is people realizing, ooh, 
hierarchy equals bad, non-hierarchy equals good. So I better make sure that I say that I'm in a non-hierarchical relationship, even if I haven't really done the work to even figure out, do I actually want that? <laughs> like, is that actually the relationship that I want? And I think the same thing with unicorn hunting, where I think in the past few years, I've seen a lot of couples who are looking for a third who have gotten that message, ooh, unicorn hunting equals bad. So we better make sure that we're very upfront of like, we're going to respect you. You're going to be an equal partner. You know, we're not going to expect all the unpaid childcare from you or whatever it is when maybe that's not actually what they want. Maybe it is like we want you to come over for a threesome and then leave. And we want to do that once a month. But that's come to be associated with, oh, no, that's that's the bad version. Well, of see, that it. was so absolutely my jam. That was like, that is right. all I want. I don't want to it deal with anybody's crazy. emotions at all. Because yeah. uh -huh. I was like 22, you know, like I yeah. wanted to live my own life, show up once in a while, have fun, get fed dinner and then fuck off. That was the dream. And and now I'm in a situation where I'm like, oh, I could see myself living with a couple who needs some help with childcare here and there. Maybe I don't pay rent, but I get to do the gardening and the cooking, the things that I really like to do. And in exchange, they like financially support me and I have a room of my own or whatever. I would be super down for that now. So like, I think that it's that question of being honest and being honest, even of the things that you think might sound really unappealing and like be understanding that, yeah, if you want unpaid child labor, you got to give something up. So what is that going to be? What are you giving in exchange? I don't necessarily believe that everything is a corporate dynamic in that way. But if I'm going to merge my company with yours, I would like to know that we are all getting better and bigger together and not that you're just going to suck me dry and then throw me out and fire all of my employees, which I guess would be my cats in this well, metaphor. So this is perfect, actually, because we got a question related to being honest in that way that mm -hmm. I think we can dovetail into pretty nicely here. So this listener asks, what are some tools in coping with generalized anxiety and asking for what I want from a prospective sexual partner? I certainly have layers of pleasure shame and more so find myself overanalyzing the explicitness that's appropriate for flirting or just open conversation around desires, turn-ons, curiosities. I'm demisexual and I shamefully use the label late bloomer to describe my sexual history and experience. Thus, I'm really confident that I'm using the right language and often clam up as a protection mechanism. Is the answer to actually just say the thing and risk the awkwardness of doing it wrong or my desires being exposed as abnormal? Are there any strategies to build confidence when speaking to desire and, you know, building an internal assuredness that the desire itself is valid and okay? I think it aligns with the channel that we're about to go down. I'm generally of the opinion that it's better to just say the thing and be awkward. I feel, though, I mean, I lean in really heavily into my awkwardness. So that is a big part. of That's part of my charm is that I'm very awkward <laughs> and also extremely blunt. So, you know, that is something that if that's your jam, then I appeal to you because that is kind of how I exist. That said, I have also been on a lot of dates with people who have taken that aspect of myself to mean that I want to have an explicit like phone sex level conversation on the first date before we've even gotten through an appetizer. And that's not always ideal. I think it comes back to that question about investment and building investment in each other. I think that when I was doing sex work, I remember I counseled a lot of people who wanted to, who wanted to bring their partner into their sexual fantasies and didn't know how. And oh, I had to tell so many people, like, please do not put on the gimp suit and surprise your wife. Like, don't do it that way. <laughs> that is not going to get you what you want. That is going to be deeply alarming because for her, she's probably seen that in relationship to like serial killers. So like, right. you got to think yeah. about context, you know, yeah. and you've got to think about I like to present desires in a way that like this is fun for me. Would this be fun for you? What do you think about this? What is something that you've done that you found really enjoyable? Like rather than taking these opportunities to be like, here's all my stuff, blah. I try to tease out from them some stuff and then say, oh, that's really interesting. I'm into this sort of thing. Like, oh, I'm, I'm not as into feet, 
but I'm really into boots, you know? And like, then we can begin to build off of that in a way that's mutual. I think that generally works a lot better. And I, I say all that because I know sometimes with awkwardness, there is just this temptation to blurt out like the biggest, scariest thing just to get it out of the way. I do think, especially if there's a power dynamic in place as well, if you are a man doing this to a woman or if you are a white person doing this to a black person or an Asian person or a cis person doing it to a trans person. Like, I just think that there are ways that that becomes that verges into fetishism in a way that is is difficult. So be being mindful of that and treating it as a conversation. And I like to let them go first, you know, if they're willing. And if they're not willing, then I take the plunge and I say something vulnerable. I kind of think of, well, what's, some, what's something that's like not my deepest, wildest fantasy, but something that's like a few stages above that. It is a risk. Sometimes you're going to say something and the other person's going to recoil. But they're also going to recoil when you bring it up in like four dates. So maybe that's better. I don't know. It depends on how you date. <laughs> Some people are much more efficient about it than others. I think they're both valid strategies. Just be okay with somebody having different opinions than you. I think the more that you can build yourself up so that you can weather that. And if they say no, you're like, awesome. Thanks for taking care of yourself rather than going home and sobbing in your bathtub with all your clothes on, I think you'll have more confidence the more you do it. Also, it's not shameful to be a late bloomer. Some of the best lovers I had in my life started having sexual escapades like into their 30s and 40s, you know? I know so many people who started exploring kink when they were in their 60s and are having a blast. And I mean... I can say for myself, I started doing sexual stuff when I was like, I did all of the kinks when I was in my 20s, and now I find all of it boring. So, you know, like, <laughs> it can have the opposite effect, too. So I would say, try to be a little gentle with yourself on that. How exciting for you that you get to explore all of this stuff now, and you're not completely jaded. <laughs> that must be great. I did want to throw out our radar framework simply because we talk about it a lot on the show, but it's also our little safe container for talking about maybe challenging subjects once a month with a partner. Now, if you're only like a few dates into a relationship with a partner, maybe you're not going to start that. But if you have an established relationship to a degree or, you know, it's kind of new, but you feel like maybe it's going somewhere and you want to explore having a safe container to talk about these types of things, that sort of takes the pressure off a bit. You have a moment where you're like, okay, we're going to talk about this today. Let's actually have a time to reflect and discuss. This is something that maybe I would be interested in trying next time we have sex. And then having an action point for let's try that once this month or whatever it is, you know, and then coming back to it the next month and seeing if it worked or not. I like that idea because, again... Sometimes sex can be a challenging thing to speak about, and, and maybe it is for this person, and I think it is for a lot of people. So try to take the pressure off by having kind of a predetermined time in which you do speak about it. Yeah, I'd also actually just really quickly add on to that. Do that with your housemates, too. Sure. Like, my housemate and I have used the, the radar strategy for us and it's been fantastic like we don't Great. have arguments anymore because we have like sort of a planned discussion point and it was so cool when she brought it up to me because she didn't know that i knew you that was just oh, like, oh, oh, shit. I that. <laughs> but like i think i think that's a really good example of how the more you practice these tools in all these other areas of your life it's, it's like any muscle. The more you exercise it, the stronger it gets. And it doesn't have to be a supercharged sexual situation. It can be, hey, I'd really like to be able to have oat milk in the morning and you keep drinking it all. Let's, can we have a conversation about resources and when to replace things? You know, it can be something that small also. Yeah, I, I wanted to throw one one more piece in to go back to what you were talking about of bringing something up and kind of building yourself up so you can weather someone's no, that this is something that, gosh, this was years ago now, I did kind of like a little 
workshop thing with some men where it was like, we're going to meet every week for, I think we did it for four weeks or six weeks, something like that. Kind of talking about dating. And one of the topics that was really important to me to bring up was making yourself easy to say no to. And it's this weird thing because in like sales and in dating, there's a lot of talk about no, but it's always in this kind of like forcing someone to say no so that you're sure you've gotten everything you possibly can from them before they say no, like in a mm -hmm. sales context or in like the pickup artist content is like, how can I somehow manipulate this person so that they're less likely to say no to me? And there's a whole lot of problems with, with all those, as you can imagine. But something that I was proposing to them and that we talked about was this idea of by making yourself easier to say no to. Because like you said, Kitty, if someone says no to you, it means they trust you to a mm -hmm. certain extent to not freak out at them or try to guilt them or convince them or whatever when they said no to you. And so by making yourself or like asking things in a way that makes no an easier answer to give, you're trying to one, like establish that you are trustworthy. And then also if you know that they can say no to you, you can trust their yeses more. But yeah. something that was kind of a, I didn't even realize this at the time, but that was a fun side effect of it is that by putting things out there that way, it also makes the nose hurt less because you, mm -hmm. you kind of gave it to them. You like made that easier. And so just to throw that out there with this question and bringing up, you know, kinks or, or things that you wanted to try of having that no be really easy so they don't have to kind of be as awkward and try to figure out how to say no to it can also make it hurt less. So just just to throw that one in there, too. I also wanted to toss in just one of my favorite resources for this. I think we've shouted it out on the podcast before, but I love Mojo Upgrade. If you just go to mojoupgrade.com, literally mm. what it is, is they've built this tool where it's like you take this little quiz. It presents you with a bunch of different sexual acts, everything from very, quote unquote, tame stuff like a sensual massage up to much more explicit, much more hardcore stuff, stuff that involves other people. Of course, the there's a bottomless well of kink, so it doesn't cover absolutely everything you could possibly do, but it covers like some of the common stuff, including some of the quote unquote, maybe more weirder, less mainstream stuff. And you and a partner fill it out separately, and then it'll only show you where the two of you agree, where you both indicated, mm. yeah, we're both interested in this. So that if you are feeling a little ashamed or you're not sure that you're ready to tell this person when you're only four dates in, that you're really into, you know, rim jobs or whatever it is, that... You don't necessarily have to reveal that. Now, as this tool, I think it's just a starting point. It's not a be all and end all. But I do think, especially for when you're early in a relationship and you're just kind of getting to know someone, if anything, it's also a really great tool that gets you talking about all the wide variety of sex hacks and ways that people can pleasure each other that that is out there. So I really recommend that. You can just go to mojoupgrade.com and it's totally free also. Yeah. And it can be a lot of fun to start those conversations from there. You know, I don't know if, if you all remember, this is like old internet stuff, but there was a really great video that had two college kids having a sexual negotiation and they call their lawyers in and the lawyers <laughs> yes, I remember actually that one. do the I negotiation. I, I I would show the that at workshops and I, you know, people would be like, ha, 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 that's ridiculous. I was like, honestly, I wish that was how it was. Like, <laughs> that'd be amazing. And I mean, again, even if you have, because I know that there's been apps where they were looking at stuff like that. That doesn't mean that just because you've negotiated that yes, in theory, it means that yes, in practice or right now. Um, but yeah, I always love the idea of like just having your sex lawyer present yeah. <laughs> like, that, that's my kind of non-monogamy i'm a capricorn what can i say oh well it's okay i mean this podcast attracts a lot of process nerds and people who are really <laughs> into the legalese of communication yeah. as it were god that makes it sound so unsexy well, i don't know i mean i think it can't be super sexy i i would love to see us see that as more sexy and more fun you mm -hmm. know I mean, again, like, I understand that I am a weird person in some ways in that I do have a te tendency to have conversations of relationships as like mergers and stuff, because that's how my brain understands 
how these things work in a way of like corporate responsibility. <laughs> like, you know, one of the questions that came up in the teen workbook that I was working on was, is consent sexy? And I feel like that's that's such a complicated question because I don't think it has to be, but of course it can be. It just it's it's one of those things where I think our response to like consent is sexy and then the argument, no, consent is mandatory. I mean, it can be both. It just doesn't have to be either, you know, and the way I explained it to the teens was, yeah, if your parents come into your room when you're not there, that's them violating your consent. That's not sexy or not sexy. That's just like that's not part of it at all. You know, like that's just a completely separate thing. Things can be valid and important without necessarily having to be sexy. But also, I think, like, we should we should be more cool with that and, like, more cool with flirting in those ways and allowing it to be awkward and sexy at the same time or mm -hmm. uncomfortable and sexy at the same time. I love that. We're going to go on to some more questions, but first we're going to take a quick break to talk about some ways you can support this show. If you love having this content come to you and be able to share it with everyone out there, for free every week, just please take a moment and listen to our sponsors and find ways to support this show. It really does directly support us being able to keep doing this and getting this out there in the world. And we're back. Our next question here. Oh, this person has a, a sign off. This is my favorite of the sign offs for this week. This one is, I'm 41. No, oh, me too. I'm 41 and have been in monogamous relationships for my whole adult life. I ended my latest relationship a few months ago and I'm looking into non-monogamous relationships and quite honestly, some attachment-free hookups. When arranging meetups with people met online, how should I approach consent and discussing what I'm willing to do ahead of time so there aren't many shocks or awkward moments but without coming off as rigid or unwilling to try things once I've become more comfortable. And this is from Looking for Action in Arizona. Oh, it was wonderful. That's exactly the so kind good. of sign off that we've been looking yeah, for. That's what we wanted. I added some supplementary questions to attach to this question because there were many questions sort of related to this. I feel like a piece of this is you know, does consent always have to involve explicitly navigating up front exactly what we want each and every time? Some people asking, is there a more organic model? Is it ever okay to be like, let's feel it out? Like, is there ever a model where that can still be ethical? Like, I feel like there's some of that in this question too. It's so interesting because this is definitely a question I addressed a lot in the teen workbook. And I kind of wish I could go back to ask yourself and address it more in that because I realized, oh, yeah, like this is something I'm like, great, I could talk to teens about this. I was like, actually, a lot of adults need help with this, too. It's really it's really hard. One of the things that I wanted to address with the teens and, you know, also just with everybody generally there's a lot of consent that happens that is unspoken. There's a lot of body language around consent. I think people shy away from that because it's easy to be misinterpreted. One thing I didn't include in the book because I tried to veer away from studies, side note, a lot of the studies that have been done around consent negotiation tend to be very focused on heteronormative relationships. And um, of course, of course. And because yeah. of that, I feel like they come up with conclusions that can be easily misread as men are monsters. Men are men are like waiting to rape you all the time. And I don't think that that's true. I think that sometimes with scientific studies, we have to understand that somebody is paying them and they're paying them to find something in particular. So that is an important thing to like be aware of and wary of. And also, we always come to everything with our own bias. So we tend to prove our own hypothesis. So when this came up for the teens, I was like, oh, this is interesting because there is a study about this that showed that, and again, heterosexual, heteronormative situation here. So I don't, I'm not saying that this is across the board or whatever, but anyway, this one college in heterosexual situations, they found that men had a tendency to read consent when they wanted consent to be there. 
Sure. And that women were more likely to hesitate and ask for verbal consent in in this particular study. Like the women had a tendency to be like, I'm not sure, so I'm going to make sure. And men would be like, they didn't say no, so that's a yes. Now, I don't think that that means necessarily anything manipulative or devious. I think that, uh, you know, I mean, I can also say, and this is why I think it's important to acknowledge biases in studies, there have definitely been situations that I've been in where I was like, I'm not going to ask because in this situation at this workplace, it is easier to ask forgiveness than permission. And I'm going to do that. Is it 100% ethical? No. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and I'm going to do it anyway. So I, I do wonder how much of that is a cultural norm in general. And if this is true outside of sexual relationships as well, I do think that we reward people who attempt um, more that like we make fun of people for not trying, for not, you know, taking taking their shot or whatever. So I think that you you are going to see a little bit of these biases crop up. And I don't know that that's necessarily indicative of a social norm. All that to say <laughs> that nonverbal consent is an incredibly important part of how we negotiate consent all the time. And I would love to see us talk more as a society about what that looks like. Like under like th that is one area where pickup artistry actually could have done something really cool. All, all the things they could have done. <laughs> I mean, there is some, th th you know, I read second wave feminists because not everything that they said is trash. Some mm -hmm. of it is definitely trash. Some of it like is 100 percent consent possible under a white supremacist mm -hmm. patriarchy capitalist society. I think that's a very interesting thing to think about. But, you know, the transphobia and the racism is bullshit. Same with the pickup artistry. They had some really interesting points about like, are they mirroring your body language? Are they leaning into you or leaning away? Are they meeting your like, are they giving good eye contact? These are ways that you could tell if somebody is vibing with you. I wish that we taught that more often because I think that there are all these little ways that we communicate that if you're looking for it, you begin to, to notice that. For example, exciting little thing, and I don't know if this is something that you all as a podcasting team do on purpose or if it's incidental, but I was noticing that when one of you wanted to speak, you would put your f hey, finger up. We didn't have that conversation, but mm -hmm. I started to recognize, oh, that means they have something to say. Okay, cool. And like, that's an example of nonverbal consent, of being open to like noticing cues and being like, oh, interesting. So th yes, I think that there can be an organic way to have that happen, but you also kind of have to know each other and you have to be comfortable being wrong. So mm -hmm. I think that it is it is riskier to rely on nonverbal consent. As you get to know somebody better, it's a little bit easier, but yeah, I think that that is absolutely a part of the dynamic. It reminds me of some theory of language learning and language acquisition that there is this argument that if you're learning a new language, it's not just about learning the words and the grammar. You have to learn about the culture and the history as well. You know, maybe, mm. maybe not, maybe you don't have to go get your PhD in this particular country's culture, but language is so built in with culture and influenced by culture and vice versa that you have to have some of that cultural knowledge in order to actually understand the language and understand which context is it okay for me to use this word or to use this particular grammar principle. And that's what it makes me think mm -hmm. of that we can put so much emphasis on, yeah, consent is just the word spoken, is just the yes or no, is just the transaction. Because we're trying to make it a contract. We're trying to make right. it right. Yeah. Yeah. somehow. Yeah. See, but, capitalism sneaking in again. Yes, yeah, yes there it is. but there is still <laughs> this like living, beating, literal body underneath it that is also part of understanding this language. And then, of course, like you pointed out, Kitty, that this also changes depending on how well do I know this person's body language or not? How often do we actually check in? Even if I've been with them for 10 years, you know, how often do I check in despite 
knowing their body language quite well, that it's, it's like requires both of those things. Yeah. Well, and our body language changes as we change. Nothing, nothing is static. I, I like to talk about consent culture as being a living document and that there's sort of always, especially my understanding to it is something that's always shifting and, you know, evolving in different ways. And I pick up new little bits of information here and there and I sort of wind it into the rest of the stuff that I know. I think that improv actually has probably been one of the best ways for me to train myself in understanding body language and learning how to have those kinds of conversations. Now, granted, I do that because I like tabletop role-playing games. So I'm a very <laughs> specific kind of nerd. But I do think that that is an example of a way that you can begin to learn, oh, this person's about to say something, so I'm going to step back and let them take some space. Or like, oh, how do I yes and this? You know, how do I, yeah, but this kink or whatever, you know, how do I build off of it so that it's not shutting down conversation? It's like adding more information and more layers. I, and I also think that it can be really difficult when you are looking for casual sex to figure out how, again, it's like that question we had before of like how much to put out there. And when I, I think you just got to try a lot of things to see what works best for you and for your environment. You know, I mean, in the Bay Area, it feels like I know about my grocery store clerks kinks. Like we're very <laughs> open, too open, some might say, about It's a Trader Joe's, right? It has to be yeah. yeah, right. Like, okay. I mean, honestly, it's any of them. Um, but I, I live in I live in Berkeley, so it's it's very it's very close <laughs> to uh, close to the surface here. And like if you're in I don't, like in Massachusetts, people are not going to be as upfront because it's just not that kind of culture. So I think seeing what other people do and seeing what feels good to you and what is getting you the response that you are excited about. Well, also, yeah, always letting people say no. I remember doing a workshop on nonverbal consent at a, a gay sex party and explaining to these guys like, hey, if you're trying to negotiate a sexual situation, don't stand in front of a door. Mm. Like, let people get around you. Wow. And they were just like, oh, my God, I never thought about that. Like, if I'm talking to someone in the bathroom and I'm not I'm physically in the way of them leaving the bathroom, they can't leave this conversation. So they might have this nonverbal pressure to acquiesce in some way just so they can get out. Um, and it's just so interesting the ways that we just don't normally think about this stuff. Gosh, yeah, I'm really glad you brought up the, the position and body language thing, because that's also something that as men we see modeled really poorly in film and television just sort of the the body language and positioning in front of doorways and over someone and blocking them in is seen as sexy or romantic or whatever. And it's like, mm -hmm. sure, if that's your vibe and everyone's into that, sure. But in most situations, that's not where you should start. And that's something you should be aware of. And we're just not. We're not really socialized to be aware of it. It's not something therapists are even aware of, like therapists who still see patients yeah. in office. That's something that was like really valuable when I did my SE training was just being aware of that, of there's, first of all, there is power in literally just not putting yourself in between the client and the door as it is. Mm -hmm. And then second, like so much power also in literally letting a client choose where they want to be in the room, right? And like negotiating that and navigating that. But that's a little bit of a di digression. I, I mean, is it? I think that's absolutely I guess it's fair, it's, the yeah. same. It's not. It's not. Yeah. You know, I mean, like I'm somebody if I'm on a date with someone, I want to have my my head facing the door because I want to see everything around me. Like I'm I'm one of those people that wants to have my back to the wall. I've done a lot of protests and I've <laughs> just got this like paranoia at this point where I'm just like, all right, I have to see everything. Though I, I also wanted to say on on that point that. I have also, as someone who has dated a lot of women, I have definitely experienced dating women who were actively upset with me for asking them or for being hesitant and not just ravishing them. 
And that was very frustrating as somebody who is like, learning about consent and being like, but I don't want to be that kind of person. I don't want to create more of that in the world. I feel like that might be your thing today right now, but that feels like that's going to go badly at some point. And I don't want that to be me. I think one thing that's really important to remember about that, you get to consent to your behavior. You get, you can only control your behavior. If that is not something that's comfortable for you, you don't have to do it. If that is a risk that you're not willing to take, that is okay. And I, that was hard to learn that I, I wanted to make these women I was dating happy. I wanted to do the things that they wanted, but I was very uncomfortable with this sort of like, just keep trying stuff until I stop you. I just didn't, I didn't feel okay with that, you know? I bring that up because I also want to acknowledge that our culture does sexualize that for women and it does teach women and I mean, not just women, but uh, often women that sex is something that happens to us and that we don't get to be active participants in it. And the best we can do is sort of shut it down when we're when we're done but we don't get to be like an interactive part of that conversation. No, we don't get to drive the um, car. We don't get to drive yeah. the car. Right, exactly. And so I think that that is a part of that equation that's so hard because I think, you know, men are learning and being like, shit, I don't want to be that person. But also I keep going on dates where women are like, why didn't you just kiss me? Well, mm -hmm. because I'm trying not to <laughs> right. sexually assault you. Like, <laughs> what do you want? Yeah, like, I'm and I, I just, I think that that's, I can see how that's frustrating for everyone involved. You know, we mm -hmm. know that we, that people can't read our minds and also we want them to read our minds. Mm -hmm. And why can't both those things be true? <laughs> Uh, we, we have one more question we wanted to get to. I just wanted to throw one last thing to kind of bring this back to the question asker, talking about how much to talk about beforehand. In this situation, talking even like we're talking online, we haven't even met up in person yet. I would just throw out there all the stuff that Kitty is saying is great about, you know, this is something that continues to be negotiated, but also... I could see how there'd be this urge to say, yeah, let me be really clear about what I want to do and let's negotiate that beforehand to feel like, oh, look, I'm being so proactive about consent. But the dark side of that is by talking about this beforehand, it can feel like to the other person, they've now committed to something that maybe in the moment they're not going to want to do. And they might feel like it's actually harder to say no to that then after the fact, once they've agreed to it beforehand. So I would say maybe don't stress so much about trying to be so meticulous about those things beforehand. And instead, like Kitty's been talking about, learn to get more comfortable with asking and receiving those no's and things there and, and really developing that part of the communication. Does that seem fair to kind of bring it back to the question, Kitty? Yeah, I think I think that's really good. You know, I mean, I do think it's helpful if you're like, I am looking for a casual sex situation. I might be open to renegotiating that down the line. But right now, this is what I want. Take it yeah. one day at a time, I guess. Yeah. You know, I, I can understand why I negotiate something like that. If you really want to have a rope bondage scene using teacher student role play, and that is what you are meeting up with this person for. I can kind of understand you saying like, this is this is the purpose. Are you the person for this? Right. Cool or no. Just understand that that does create that sort of there is a rigidity that happens when you when you plan ahead to that extent, which can be comforting, but can also make you feel entrapped. There's like a potential expectation. And I, I recommend if you're looking for casual situations, I really recommend like get a hotel or something, have a neutral third space. I know that's not always financially feasible, but the more that you can make it possible for everyone to leave, the better. Mm -hmm. I think that that can feel a lot safer. I used to like to hook up at like hot tub places. There were like a couple sleazy hot tub places where that is absolutely where people went to fuck in their mm -hmm. afternoons. And like, that was great because it was for one hour. I didn't have to use my real name. It wasn't a huge financial commitment. 
they cleaned it after every person, so it felt comfortable. Well, I like I'm that was so perfect. sorry. <laughs> I I've never heard of a hot tub place. Maybe yeah, all this of a sudden, really, what are you talking about? Really, no, there, oh my god! I've I'm been like to one and it was awesome. Store? Yeah, really? no, I went to like no, this not the hot, hot tub, tub store. <laughs> don't don't fuck people <laughs> in the hot tub <laughs> store. Oh my god, they don't like that. <laughs> Emily, no. you've been to a hot tub place. Yeah, Josh and wow. I went to. It was like a tea room and kind of hot tub. It was very sort of Japanese. Actually, it was lovely. I'm sure there are sleazier ones than that one, but but yeah, you were we were. <laughs> I was naked with my partner. Yeah, like, we had our own separate little hot tub area. And we definitely could have, like, had sex in there. They would knock on the door and be like, do you want more tea? And we were like, sure, or you could say no. So they exist. Wow. Check your local listings. (laughs) In the Bay Area, there's a lot of, like, private room hot tub places. Because there's places that have hot tubs that you can go to, but they're communal. Again, not ideal. Don't bring your sexy stuff to that kind of hot tub place. But there's, like, a couple of places there's a massage table that's definitely a bed and it, mm. like at that point you're like okay i understand like this is where you hire a sex worker you know mm-hmm. which yeah. incidentally is where i did a lot of my early <laughs> sex work i loved that because i had control there and so i could have that kind of hookup and i knew i knew that there was somebody there were workers there so if i had an emergency there was an intercom that was great I didn't have to bring like a bunch of cash or anything on me or identification. So I could have that moment without having any of these anxieties about like, what if I get robbed or like whatever. And because it was that neutral space, I didn't have to worry that I didn't know what I was getting into. Now, again, I will say that probably sounds super paranoid. It is in part because I was a sex worker for a long time. So you kind of had to have that wariness about right. you. I also think it's really cool to have that kind of neutral space so that you can kind of dip in as much as you want and dip out. They don't know where you live. It creates a little bit more safety for it to just be a fun encounter until you trust each other more. I've learned so much today. <laughs> Not just we about hot tub have. places. <laughs> I mean, I have. really wish I wish that we had more spaces that were like bathhouses, like gay bathhouses. And I mean, we don't even have that many gay bathhouses in the mm-hmm. Bay anymore. But like these kinds of spaces where it's okay for you to engage in sexual behavior with somebody that you've just met, where there's lots of people around. So there is that sense of like, there's like whatever happens will be witnessed. <laughs> That feels really comfortable for me. Probably not for everybody. Right. I'm more of an exhibitionist, so that didn't bother me. I just liked that feeling of like, okay, there's enough people around that if you try anything, I will be able to get away. Yeah. Right, like Love um, Hotel, like Love Hotel culture in Japan. They're freaking great. <laughs> I mean, even if it's not like, oh, I just met this person to hook up. But yeah, someplace that's like clean quiet, reasonably priced, and where, yeah, if there's an emergency, you're going to have access to someone or something, or, you know, yeah. you're, you're not just like stuck at somebody's house or having to pay out the nose for a really expensive hotel room. So we have one last question that we want to get into yes. today before we wrap up. Here it is. I have found a way to navigate situational mutism, something that stems from my autism during sex via nonverbal safe words but it was really challenging to get there. It feels like there is a lot of shame slash mistrust aimed at people who cannot say no with the current consent paradigm, which definitely contributed to me trying to should myself toward verbal communication in these moments. I thought if I just say no, they would stop. I know they hold consent as a value, so if I speak up, but some people told me that they couldn't trust me and my consent if I couldn't give them that in the moment, yes versus no. The current model of I can't trust you if you can't say no seems to not account for realities like trauma histories or being people pleasers. So how do others handle that? I can see this one in my own life for sure as a as a people pleaser. It's really difficult sometimes when you're like, yeah, I I, I didn't say no to you because I just didn't want to hurt you in the moment. I didn't want to make you feel little or bad. This is 
challenging with power dynamics, I think, with women and men and in a lot of other power dynamics as well, because we don't want to make someone feel bad. We don't want to say no to them when they really want to do something, even and, though maybe we or should. Or we want to seem strong. Yeah. yeah. I, I think you don't even have to have a trauma history necessarily. Like the times in my life that I think of where I look back and I'm like, wow, why did I say yes to that? Whether it was sexual or work related or anything, I was like, why did I say yes to that? It's like sometimes this decision making, especially when it feels connected to your survival in some way, happens mm -hmm. in the blink of a second. You don't even have a, and our, our society doesn't really set us up to be like, okay, they asked you if you do something, sit and let and feel that in your body. Like before you tell your boss whether or not you're going to come in on, on a day that you're not supposed to come in. It's, yeah, it's, if it could I, be like know, a video game where it freeze no, frames on I, that. Yes, no. I and you get to spend as long as you want. <laughs> With I fucking yeah. do this. I, when I go up to the coffee counter, and somebody's like, what do you want? Like immediately. And I'm like, huh, pick something. And I just pick something. And then I look like as they're making the item for me. And I'm like, fuck, I really would have actually liked that thing. But I felt like it was an imposition to make them sit there for a second longer while I looked. That's how bad that shit is for me. I, and I don't think that's rare at all. I mean, I remember one of the first things I did with consent culture back in 2011, I think, was I did a consent culture blog carnival. I think this was before, like I was doing consent culture workshops, but I think it was still called Safe Ward. So like moving towards safety, ward, not word. Oh, Safe anyway, Ward. Anyway, um, uh. yeah, I was trying to be way too clever. I yeah. learned very quickly to stop doing that the age of the internet. <laughs> like once you have to spell things out, it's too clever. Mm -hmm. My blog used to be called Perversatility, like purr Ooh. like a cat and I'd have uh, to spell it out. And I was like, this is a nightmare. Why did I do this? <laughs> um, but one of the things that I thought was really interesting was I asked dominance and submissives of all gender identities, what were some situations where they didn't say no and they wish that they had? And I found that in general, most of most of the people at this time identified on a binary, but a lot of the men, whether submissive or dominant, didn't say no or didn't stop it because they wanted to seem cool or they wanted to seem strong. They wanted to seem capable. And women, whether they were dominant or submissive, wanted to please their partner. And I was like, oh, God, no wonder this is so murky because this is like very much a gendered training that we are subjected to and sort of forced into. I feel so called out right now by by that <laughs> explanation. I'm like, fuck. <laughs> yeah, I never thought yeah. of it like yeah, that. Right? That's so true. <laughs> Shit. Well, and I think I think that's really important because I think when I've seen this conversation come up, a lot of times there is an understandable focus on women not feeling safe saying no. But I feel like I have encountered a lot of men not feeling comfortable or safe saying no. Not because they were afraid that I would overpower them or force them, but because they were afraid of how they'd feel about themselves. Wow. They were afraid that they would be disappointing themselves in some way or like they wouldn't be performing masculinity in this very specific way by saying no. Patriarchy fucks us all. My God. It fuck, man. Like, <laughs> yeah. what the fuck? I wanted to jump on that just really quick. It's so interesting you bring up the performance of masculinity because I've heard a lot of men who go to play party spaces or sex club spaces or swingers spaces saying that if a woman comes on to them or asks them to engage in some particular way and they are not interested a part of performing masculinity is, well, men are assumed to be always down. And so if I say no to this woman, even though I think she's great, and maybe even if I think she's attractive, she's going to feel hurt because I'm a man who's supposed to be always down for any type of sexual contact regardless. And so, OK, I'll just say yes. So I just wanted to slip mm -hmm. that in there because it feels like that's a part of the whole needing to perform a particular version of masculinity that gets in the way. Yeah, absolutely. Well, and I mean, I remember I actually got into a huge fight with one of the BDSM writers that I had admired so much. We got into a huge fight online about this because she was like, well, if a submissive doesn't say for it, that's on them. And I was like, whoa, OK, no, 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 no. <laughs> like, that is not OK. There are lots of reasons why someone might not say no in the moment, because, hey, just a 
little thing to keep in mind, if you say no and the other person keeps going, at least for me, that is way more traumatic than if I don't say anything. Mm. Because if I feel like I have control over the situation and I just chose not to do anything, that makes me feel more safe or more like I had control and any hurt that happened is on me rather than being like, I didn't have control. That was outside of my control. I think that's a really hard thing to sit with, but I think that's a really, really important thing to think about that. Like that is a reason why people don't say no, because it feels less traumatic to have it be a misunderstanding. Even if it can, if it's a willful misunderstanding that you're participating in just because you don't want to deal with the consequences if it was forced. Right. So yeah, I have a lot of problems with the idea that saying to somebody else that you have to be able to negotiate consent in this way that I approve of, because again, you don't control other people. If you, if the way that they negotiate consent isn't comfortable for you, that's okay. You can choose not to engage, but you can't tell them how to be. Kind of like how I say that thing about if I can't say no, then my yes doesn't mean anything. That's about me and my ability to assess my options, my behavior. It's not about telling somebody else how to be. I can give people as many opportunities as possible, but I can't at the end of the day control what their consent looks like. And I shouldn't be able to because that wouldn't be consensual. That like it, it fundamentally ruins its own premise. So I think that letting people know what your nonverbal safe words are, body language related stuff. Like I found that if I became really still, that was an indication to check in with me. There were certain sort of red flags or maybe not even red flags, yellow flags. That's like, if you see these things, it's time to switch it up and maybe take a break to have some water or have a snack. And we can continue afterwards, but like, let's just like take it down a notch for a bit. I think that that's super valid. And like, I think that there, that's a way that you can, as a sort of a top in that situation, you can kind of guide it in a way that you as a top don't feel like, ah, I am not getting an active yes. And so I feel uncomfortable. That's a way that you can kind of reassure yourself because I think as a top it's really scary when you aren't sure because there's a lot of accountability and responsibility in being a top that's part of what makes it fun and also what makes it really scary I like to create spaces for those little check-ins not so much to be like tell me what you think and how you feel right now but more like just giving them space to engage in a way that's comfortable for them Sort of like pulling back a little bit to see if they push into you or if they stay pulled back is like one of those ways to say, okay, like maybe we do need a little bit space here. Like, you know, I think it's, it's like a dance where mm -hmm. you're trying to read each other. I've seen some really skillful tops too who come up with very good ways of doing that without breaking the scene. Mm -hmm. Of kind of this, uh, like the example that comes to mind is, this is going to sound silly out of context here, but you know, this kind of like, oh, you're so bad. I bet you deserve a spanking now, don't you? Where it's like, you're asking yeah. them a question, but you're kind of doing it in character in a way. And if they're like, uh, yeah, then you're like, okay, no, this is, let's change directions. <laughs> yeah. I guess. <laughs> I guess. <laughs> yeah. Right. Whereas if there's a, like, that excited, enthusiastic oh, no, or yes, or, you know, just like the attitude of it being that way yeah. gives you that oh, sign. Oh, no. <laughs> right, right, exactly, exactly that. Yeah. So kind of, like, there's ways to do it as the top in that case that are more organic, you know, that, that don't break the mood. I have a kind of gross one. So I, uh, if you are someone, a listener who has issues with poo... Skip, skip ahead, ahead a few minutes, skip ahead. Yeah. yeah. Skip ahead, but... I was doing a pro doming session with somebody who claimed that they really, really wanted to eat their own poo. And I was like, I don't think that's true. <laughs> I, I, I mean, maybe, but I'm not sure. I think a lot of people have fantasies about things 
that they've never actually encountered. And our bodies have a lot of, like, things in place that actively repulse this. So, like, maybe, but also probably not. You probably don't want the thing that you are actively asking for. So how do I, as a dominant, but also as a professional, create space for this? And I decided what I was going to do, I, like, fingered his butt a little bit, and then... And of course, he hadn't like prepared or anything, which makes me even more sure that he wasn't actually that into this. He hadn't thought this through. And so I was like, oh, this is great. So I pull I pull the glove off and I tie it very loosely and I have him hold it in his mouth while I give him a caning. And I say, if you drop this glove, then I am going to make you eat what's inside. And that was the way for me to be like, yeah. I am in my position as a dom. I'm also giving you the opportunity to have the thing you want, but I'm pretty sure you don't want that. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and he held on to that glove like his life depended on it. He did. He did there not was your want answer. that. <laughs> there was your answer. And that was one of those situations where I was like, this is so gross that I can't share this with most people. <laughs> but also, God, that was a stroke of genius to pat myself yeah. on the back well a little done. bit. Because yeah. I was like, I mean, I'm not ethically against it. It's it's all you. It's your stuff. Disease wise, there's some risk, but I mean, not that many. But also, I was just like, I'm really not sure that you want this thing that you say that you want. And it was a great way for me to be like, you can ramp this up. But that is a choice that you have to actively make here, <laughs> not by asking for it, but by doing this behavior that then has this clear consequence. So, yeah. In short, there are lots of ways to do that. <laughs> <laughs> for good or for evil, I suppose. And also, I felt much more comfortable with doing it in that way because I was not forcing him. Right. I didn't want to force him to do this thing because I felt that was... That it just got really complicated for me in terms of like, uh, is this really consensual or not? So it was like a great way for us to have this consent dance indirectly that was also a bit of a game of chicken <laughs> well it's a great note to end on um i it's funny we gotta go because oh. <laughs> well it's because i literally wrote down in my notes like prompting you kitty to be like do you have anything to plug and that question feels very different now <laughs> but yeah, where right? can do you have anything to plug and where can people find more of you and your work well, I am at kittystriker.com. You can find me on Facebook, officially Kitty Striker. I'm on Medium as Kitty Striker. I'm on Instagram as Kitty underscore Striker. I'm on Blue Sky and Mastodon. I, pretty much most places, if you look for Kitty Striker. You can see my Twitter archive at, at Kitty Striker. I don't think they've deleted my account. They just won't let me log in. And I'm generally pretty available. Like my email is on my website. If you want to send me an email, if you have a question, that's totally cool. I am very good at my boundaries and I will let you know exactly how much time I have to invest in answering your question. <laughs> wonderful. Amazing. Wonderful. Thank you so much, Kitty. This has been fantastic. Oh, Definitely I go. Plug the book. Yeah, yeah, oh, yeah. Go. For yes, sure. Sure. Write your book. yes, I just wrote a workbook for teens that is going to be coming out in April. That's going to be called Say More, the Consent Conversations for Teens. That'll be out through Thorn Apple Press. And then currently you can get Ask Yourself, the Consent Culture Workbook. That is also available from Thorn Apple Press or Amazon or all these, you know, thrift books, aid books, whatever. And I'm going to be doing a series of consent conversations based off of questions from my book. Each week is going to be a different section. So we'll have like the internal introspective week and then we'll do intimate relationships, then we'll do community and then we'll go back to like reflections. Um, that's going to be starting through Firestorm Cooperative online and it starts September 10th at 11 a.m. I believe Pacific. You could find out more information about that on officially Kitty Striker on Facebook or through Firestorm Cooperative. Is that something that people can join late if they're not there for the first few sessions? Oh yeah, the, each each session is going to be a separate conversation. So, um, and I'm I'm happy to run it if there is one other person there or if there's fifty people there. So. 
you know, I, I'm going to do it as long as there is someone else to talk to about it. I will be there. By the time this episode comes out, you'll already be a few weeks into it. So I just wanted to let people know that they can still yes. come and join for the last ones if they didn't make it to the first ones. Yeah, and I will, I will be making sure that the questions are ones that you don't have to have prior knowledge. Um, I'll be doing like right. a little intro each time. And then and then we're just it's like a book club. We're just going to sit around and talk about one of the questions from uh, from Ask Yourself. Awesome. Wonderful. Well, speaking of questions. OK, listeners. So our question this week that's going to be on our Instagram stories. What are the nonverbal cues for consent that you look out for? Again, you can go to our Instagram at multiamory underscore podcast and answer that question in our stories. Also, the best place to share your thoughts on this episode with other listeners is in the episode discussion channel in our Discord server, or you can also post about it in our private Facebook group. You can get access to these groups and join our exclusive community by going to patreon.com slash multiamory. In addition, you can share with us publicly on Twitter, Facebook, Instagram, or TikTok. Multiamory is created and produced by Jace Lindgren, Emily Matlack, and me, Dedeker Winston. Our production assistants are Rachel Schenewerk and Carson Collins. Our theme song is Forms I Know I Did by Josh and Anand from the Fractal Cave EP. The full transcript is available on this episode's page on multiamory.com. 